On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, should the United States Navy be built in Asia? Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to today's episode. So there was two articles that came out that have garnered a lot of attention in the military naval world. And I want to talk about both of them, break them down a little bit, and discuss this concept that because shipbuilding is so bad in the United States, we should export the building of U.S. naval vessels overseas, particularly to Japan or Korea or other countries. Uh, it's an interesting idea that has a lot of positives and negatives to it. I'm going to come on the negative side a little bit. But we're going to take a look at both those articles. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. So this is article number one over at the drive, the war zone section. Alarming naval intel slide warns of China's 200 times greater shipbuilding capacity. This article came out on July 11th and really warns that basically China can outbuild us 200 times, which shouldn't be a shock to anybody, to tell you the truth. Everybody should have known that this was happening. And then article number two is this one over at Real Clear Defense by Patrick Drennan. Should the U.S. Navy outsource ship building to Japan and South Korea. And as I mentioned to you before, both of these are really interesting ideas that we should have a discussion about. However, I'm going to come down in the end with my perspective on it. All right, let's go ahead and look at that first article first in the drive. So this is the image in the slide that garnered a lot of attention. It, it is this, showing China's shipbuilding capacity. Each of those ship vessels represent 100,000 gross tons. And as you can see there, the China has a bit more than the United States. Now, I will say the article kind of tilts this on a very military perspective, when in truth, most of that shipbuilding capacity, almost all of it, is in commercial shipbuilding capacity. Right now, China is the largest commercial shipbuilder in the world. About 44% of all the world's ships are built in China. The other remaining 56%, 6% are spread out around the world with 50% split between Korea and Japan. So if you look just within range of China, Japan, and Korea, you have 94% of the world shipping. Philippines has 1%, the rest, again, Europe has maybe about 2.5% of that total. The US is 0 0.05, got a whole video that shows you that. You can go to, through the top 15 shipbuilders. The area that, of course, this article kind of focuses on is on the military. And when you look at the navies, there are issues for concern. One of the things we see is that China is building a lot of ships. Now, the U.S. by tonnage is much larger than the Chinese Navy. The Chinese Navy is larger by number of ships, but U.S. builds aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers are these big, huge 100,000 ton monsters. And while China has just building their third one right now, which is almost 80,000 tons. They haven't built behemoths like the U.S. has. And there's a lot of arguments about the difference between the U.S. Navy and the Chinese Navy for a variety of different reasons. Uh, the Chinese Navy is fielding vessels like this. This is a Type 55 uh, cruiser slash destroyer. Beautiful looking ships, really sleek, state of the art, but they're pumping them out in huge numbers. Now, everybody in the U.S. Navy will tell you, well, yeah, but they haven't been proven. They're, they're, they have not been proven in combat. Well, make the argument that really neither has U.S. Navy Burke and Ticonderoga class uh, vessels in terms of the type of combat we're talking about here. They're great at launching tomahawks, doing these surface strikes. They work great in exercise when you have tech reps on board and you're all prepped and take days to get ready for a fire. But the question is, are you ready the day the war happens, you turn the key and does everything work right? I don't know who works for the Chinese. I have no idea. I, I have no idea. But when people tell me that, no, it's not going to work right for the Chinese because they don't have a track record, well, People said the same thing about the Japanese and before World War II, and, and man, Japanese things worked pretty good in many ways. Yes, they lost, but still, you don't want to underrate a opponent. This is the chart that should give everybody the, the concern here. So this is the number of active shipyards by year. This is done by a, a, an outfit called BRS. They do this great report, which I'll have a link in the show notes, that looks at commercial shipbuilding around the world. And one of the things you see is going up to 2008, there was an increase in the number of shipyards around the world. But since 2008, 2009, it's decreased. About 40% of the world's shipyards have closed. And more importantly, they have consolidated together. So there are less shipyards out there. It's taking longer to build ships, and it's more expensive to build ships. That's the world right there. This is 
and break down by the major shipping companies. And the biggest one, CSSC, the China State Shipbuilding Corporation, builds 21% of the world's ships. Just that one company builds 21%. That doesn't include the other companies that are there. And all those companies you see right there are Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. It gives you an idea of the scope and scale of these companies. They're absolutely massive and huge. This is a chart that was done by Tim Colton. And Tim Colton ran a website, uh, shipbuilding, uh, shipbuildinghistory.com. Tim unfortunately passed last year, I believe. And so his site hasn't been updated. This only goes up to 2016. It was a great chart that shows you the number of shipyards in the United States. And again, one of the things you see is the decline of shipyards. But as I mentioned to you before, that's been a trend across the planet. We, we've seen this happening. A lot of people will look at this and say, well, U.S. shipbuilding is falling apart. If you come to the end here, you can see the shipyards that remain. Bath Iron up in Maine. This is electric boat in Connecticut, does nuclear submarines. Acre Philly, which was the old Philadelphia Navy shipyard. It's currently building the national security multi-mission vessels. Huntington Ingalls in Newport News, they're building the new aircraft carriers, the Ford class, and also submarines. Uh, BAE Alabama is just a repair facility now. They're not building anything. However, what it's not shown on here is Austell uh, USA, which is down in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, Ingalls Shipyard, still in existence. We still see it in, in operations down there at Pascagoula. Avondale is closed. That's no longer exist. It was in New Orleans. And then on the West Coast, you have NASCO, which is in San Diego. They're building right now the John Lewis class uh, oilers. And Vigor Seattle is no longer building. They're just doing repairs. And shipbuilding overseas is, is not a new thing. Uh, the U.S. actually has had vessels built overseas, including some in China. Uh, this is the gunboat Penay. Uh, Penay, along with five sister ships, were all built in Shanghai. And they were used as part of the Yangtze River Patrol in the 1930s and, and, and up until World War II. Penay herself was sunk in 1937 by the Japanese just outside of Shanghai. But even the Army Transport Service actually had vessels uh, built over in China for use in and around the Philippines. So I want to talk about the second article. I may talk a little bit more about this one because this is the one that really has garnered a lot of attention. So it talks about the idea that with the current U.S. Navy around 300 vessels, China is around 350 and rising fast, the U.S. is struggling to keep up, which is true. Uh, China commands some 45% to 50% of the total shipbuilding globally. Again, I think it's about 44% is the last number I saw. While the U.S. has less than 1%, 0.05 to be exact. Highly experienced South Korean and Japanese shipbuilders are building warships at half the price of those in shipyards. All right, right there. Can I say something? Japan and Korea are building basically copies of the Burke-class destroyers that we're building. Why doesn't the DOD do an analysis of the differences in cost between those three classes? You know, one of the Burks from Japan, one of the Burks from, from Korea, and one of the Burks we're building either at Bath or down at Pascagoula. Let's see where the cost issues are, because I'd really be interested in this, because understand, there are other issues at play here beyond just cost. Uh, there are issues that Japan and Korea do to incentivize shipbuilding in their countries that we don't do. Anyway, it goes on here. Uh, companies like Daewoo, Hyundai Heavy Industries uh, in South Korea, Mitsubishi Heavy, and Imbari Shipbuilding in Japan agree a price and delivery time and will take the losses if they cannot complete the agreement. They extensively utilize modular construction, robotics, AI, and automatic processing. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hang on a second here. So Japan and Korea have this crazy idea, crazy idea, that you should submit to them plans for a ship fully complete before they start building on them. Now, let me give you the idea of what I'm talking about here. This is a story over at USNI News. Back in 2022, Mallory Shelbourne did this. Fincantieri Fink begins construction of the first Constellation-class frigate. These are the new frigates being built up in Wisconsin. And I just want to come over here to a section, a section here. Start of fabrication comes nearly two and a half years after the Navy issued Fincantieri the Detailed Design and Construction Award back in April of 2020. After finishing the critical design review in May and production readiness review in July, the Navy greenlit the ship builder to start production. Rear Admiral Casey Morton, the program executive officer for unmanned small combatants, told reporters. Goes on here. 
As why it took the shipyard two and a half years to begin building the lead ship, Martin said that the service and Fincantieri wanted to complete the design as much as possible before beginning construction. Quote, it was maturing the design. It's a pretty healthy process that's got to go on. There's a fairly lengthy process of going through the functional design where we're looking system by system. And then it's a little bit of a spiral, right? If you change some things that they have impact on other things, Martin says. It just takes a while to move through that process. In order to complete the design, the shipbuilder has to get all the major vendors on contract because we're literally at the level where it's not just, okay, here's a pump. But what we need to know is which pump because we have got to have the right circuit breakers to feed that pump. How do you build a ship without having the design done? This is one of the reasons why Japan and Korea do better because the Koreans, I will tell you, will not build anything until the design is 100% done. They are not going to do a thing until it's lined up. You can't pull this crap in Korea that we're doing in the United States. You have to have the design done. And then if you want to make a change, great. That's down the line at the next ship that we haven't started yet. You don't do it. They're building ships 80% design done. You, you can't do that. It's like building a car 80% done. You know, <laughs> I hadn't quite figured out the drivetrain yet, but let's go ahead and build the car. Or it's like building a house without figuring out how the first floor is going to look. Uh, you just can't do that. And, and this is why Japan and Korea have doing it. And the reason that U.S. shipbuilders do this is because the only job in town for U.S. shipbuilders is the U.S. Navy, and they can't piss them off. And so that takes place. It has nothing to do with modular construction, robotics, AI, and automatic processing. It, that's not the issue here. It is how you build these ships, and that is the issue. So, all right, hang on. Let's, let's take a step back for a second. First off, do we really want the U.S. Navy being built in Japan and Korea beyond just degrading our technical base and our maritime infrastructure, do you really want to have all the shipyards for the U.S. Navy basically within the envelope of China? You know, again, basically you're talking about 94% of the world's ships are being built within a thousand mile circle around Okinawa. That's probably not the best idea here to concentrate all of that there, especially when it comes to U.S. Navy shipbuilding. We've already done that with commercial shipbuilding. We've already basically farmed that off overseas, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Why is Korean shipbuilding so good? Well, it helps when you get like $2 billion in support for the shipping industry from this story over in Marine uh, Executive back in November of 2022. Not to mention the fact that CSIS did a whole study, Hidden Harbors, which said that Chinese uh, shipbuilders got $132 billion from 2010 to 2018. And Japan does equally weird things when it comes to ownership of ships through their program. So again, these shipyards are not playing on a level playing field. They're getting a lot of government support. They're bringing a lot of foreign workers in to basically lower the costs. China is using cheap steel, cheap labor. And because China is undercutting everyone, Japan and Korea have to undercut their shipbuilding to keep up because they don't want to lose that industry over to China, which is growing. They mention a report. Compare this to the U.S. naval shipbuilding industry, a 2001 Commerce Department study, which, by the way, this article doesn't link to the Commerce Department study. It links to a Cato study that links to the Commerce Department study. I went to the Commerce Department study. They quote this, U.S. shipbuilding productivity has not improved since the mid-1980s and that U.S. shipyards lag their foreign counterparts in ship construction and design, shipyard layout, and product engineering. This is the conclusion from that Commerce Department study. It says shipbuilding and repair is important to the national security of the United States kind of omitted in the story over at Real Clear Defense. Frontline warships both enhance the national security and protect national interests ab abroad. It is essential that the capability and infrastructure needed to build these ships is resident in the United States because it provides added assurance that they can be built, repaired, maintained during times of conflict. Drop the mic. Seriously, he quotes an, a section from the Cato Institute, which is looking for ways to farm off U.S. shipbuilding overseas, but misses number one conclusion right here, number one conclusion that it is, provides added insurance that they can be built, repaired, maintained during times of conflict. It is essential. Seems kind of important here to talk about it. 
this uh, piece in Real Clear Defense goes on, talks about the construction of the Fincantieri frigates and what's going on with them, talking about the fact that the CBO said that in late 2020, the first 10 frigates will cost at least 12.3 billion, roughly 40% more than early Navy estimates. Well, you haven't friggin' dis- figured out how to build them yet. Yeah, cost is going to go up. And then it goes on, talks about the greatest loss to America would be the forfeiture of specialist shipbuilding skills that would take decades to replace. Which is exactly true. You see this article here by John Grady over at USNI, attracting quality workforce, biggest issue facing shipyards, experts tell Congress. Yet this is at the same time, by the way, that BAE down in San Diego is laying off 800 employees in their repair facility. Uh, We don't seem to have a coherent strategy here. Oh, and by the way, Japan and South Korea have this same issue. They're bringing in foreign workers to overcome this. And so we're seeing this this, this loss of a shipbuilding industry base throughout, not just our country, but overseas. Secondly, the U.S. Navy spends about $2.3 billion in research development on next-generation platforms. Building warships in Japan and Korea would likely require the transfer of sensitive and intellectual property. South Korea has a history of reverse engineering U.S. military equipment to manufacture weapons, which, again, is something we should really think about. It goes on, the procurement of warships is only about 15 to 20 percent of the total expenditure. It does not include maintenance, specialized weapons, fuel staff costs. The latter is not just the ship's crew, but the maintenance team, support staffs, and engineers. Look at this recent GAO study that just came out, excuse me, a, a CRS study. This is a Congressional Research Service study talking about the number of nuclear submarines in maintenance or awaiting maintenance. 37 percent of the fleet. This is 18 out of, uh, out of 49 submarines are waiting maintenance. That means we do not have enough maintenance facilities, whether it's those shipyards I showed you, the shipyards that do repairs, or the four U.S. Navy shipyards. We do not have enough capability to repair it, and that comes from shipbuilding. We just have that problem, and that is a big issue. It goes on here to talk about... Uh, uh, also our construction of auxiliary vessels. The article in Real Clear Defense says this, there's a case for auxiliary ships of the U.S. Navy to be built or at least sustained by South Korea and Japan. The U.S. Navy has only 15 tankers in their whole auxiliary fleet. They were built by General Dynamics and Northrop Grumman affiliates, and most are over 15 years old. I don't know how the frick he got that number because the oldest are in the 30s. They were built in the 80s and 90s, but there's a program right now to replace them. It's it's the John Lewis program. The first John Lewis has been launched as in service. The second one, uh, the Harvey Milk just came into service. There are at least eight or nine in different phases of construction with plans to build 20 of these. So again, I, I'm not really sure why we're seeing this right now in this article. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay, then we come to this that's going to trigger me. The biggest stumbling block to overseas construction is the 100-year-old Jones Act. The act requires that all U.S. Navy, no, No, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with the U.S. Navy. And merchant marine ships be assembled and serviced in America by American staff and manned by American crews. And that's, no, no. It's not what it says at all. It doesn't say any of that. Number one, the Navy isn't applied under the Jones Act at all. And then the only thing this applies to in the merchant marine are ships involved in the coastal trade, not the international trade. Those vessels don't have to be U.S. built. And the reason I know that is because we have ships in the international trade and they're not U.S. built. Matter of fact, the U.S. military has just chartered a whole batch of foreign built vessels, reflagging them into the U.S. fleet so that they can carry fuel because of the closing of the Red Hill facility. This is just freaking wrong. And again, I don't know why it's being printed like this because it's easy to check, but it's not. It goes on here. It is the protectionist and very popular, particularly by pork barrel politicians in military states. Okay, so military states, California, Connecticut. Yeah, uh, th- th- this is again, uh, you know, the- these heavily military states that have defense contractors. However, it is its critics and Navy support service already outsources much of its fleet. Again, just friggin', I-, I can't tell you how much is wrong with that one paragraph. Goes on, the ready reserve force, which is used to transport Army and Marine Corps unit equipment, uh, before commercial ships can be secured, cannot rely on U.S. flag ships. A report by Cato Institute, it seems as if he relied a little bit heavily on this one report by the Cato Institute, because he referenced it multiple times through here. 
Noted, dependence on foreign built ships to meet USC lift need is long standing. Of the 46 vessels in the RRF, a subset of the NDRF ready to support the rapid worldwide deployment of U.S. military forces, only 16 were constructed in U.S. shipyards. The 60 privately owned ships that participate in the maritime security program are entirely foreign built. Okay, the reason for that is because in the late 1980s, going into the 1990s, we ended something called differential subsidies for both construction and operational. This is what allowed us to compete against foreign shipyards in Europe and now in Asia. We provided these differentials and these ships were built, U.S. built, they would operate in the U.S. Merchant Marine. And at the end of 20, 25 years, when it was time to replace them, we would take those vessels, buy them, put them into the reserve fleet for a few years and then replace them with new vessels that are being built. But when we stopped building ships in the United States in the 1980s, we ended the differential construction subsidies and U.S. shipbuilding went overseas. The number of ships being built in the U.S. was just those in the coastal trade, the Jones Act. And because we were building fewer ships, it made the cost much higher. And there are fewer of them. And therefore, we've had to rely on these foreign ships. This is all the policy of the U.S. government and also the U.S. military to rely on foreign ships to do a lot of the sea lift hauling. The report goes on to talk about the fact that the U.S. is looking to overhaul vessels in foreign ports. That is true. We've uh, seen the overhaul of some military sea lift command vessels in India, for example. We do see it done in places like Japan. Remember, some vessels are forward deployed. They don't come back, actually. They stay overseas for years at a time. So it, it, it's cost prohibitive to bring vessels back in. But there are some commercial companies that actually use foreign shipping uh, shipyards because of the unavailability of shipyards in the U.S. Because shipyards in the U.S. are chocker blocked with U.S. naval vessels, it's, it's almost impossible to get in there and get a shipyard period, especially because the Navy will continually boot vessels back, delay them, add stuff. And, and it just makes it so un impossible to schedule work in a U.S. commercial shipyard that uh, companies like Matson, for example, go to China and they go to Korea and they go to Japan and they go to all these other countries because, hey, I can get in there for a shipyard and because it's subsidized like crazy, it's really cheaper and I can still pay the 50% ad valorem tax and I still come out better. I meet my shipyard period, I maintain my schedule and I'm doing this. And that's a problem because we should be fixing that because we should not see U.S. companies paying China to have their vessels fixed. Uh, it goes on here, there are patriotic reasons to maintain naval shipbuilding in the United States. I, it's not patriotic. It, it's called national security. However, to accuse U.S. military suppliers of price gouging, U.S. politicians of being nationalistic and parochial is too simplistic. U.S. naval ship bar, shipbuilders could not survive on the razor-thin margins of their South Korean and Japanese competitors. They're not surviving. They're getting huge subsidies and bailouts by them. We see that. He talks about the fact here that Imbari Shipyard in, in Japan uh, had profit losses in 2020-21. Daewoo lost $24 million last year when some of their unionized workforce went out for a strike. This is why Daewoo got like $2 billion from the South Korean government. Uh, it's why HMM, the largest shipping company in Korea, is owned by the government because they let Hanjin go bankrupt. Uh, all of this is being done. Nevertheless, the U.S. can learn a lot from South Korea and Japanese manufacturing production programs. I think they can learn not so much from their techniques, but from their management principles. The most obvious lesson is utilize modernized modern technology. It keeps coming back to modern technology. Understand, we developed the idea of modular construction in World War II. It's not new. But what needs to change here is a concept of how we operate. So when you see articles like this, that Daewoo is looking to invest into a U.S. shipyard, principally Austell, USA. Austell is looking to diverse, uh, get out of their shipyard they have in Mobile, Alabama. This is not a bad idea because Daewoo may bring in these principles. And since Daewoo is a larger company, they don't have to worry about the profitability of this one subset of their company. They can basically set the standard. The problem is no one has told the U.S. Navy, no. No, we're not going to change this order. No, we're not going to delay it. No, we're not going to start building your ship until the design is completed. And so the article ends on this statement right here. Increased incursions and threats from China and their vassal state North Korea have awakened our Asian allies, resulting in increased spending and cooperation in recent uh 
In recent trips to South Korea and Japan, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin touted closer military times. Surely it's time to soften the calls for protectionism in favor of pragmatism. Oh, I'm all for pragmatism. However, I'm not for pragmatism at the expense of national security. Because the fear here is if you start subsidizing and start sending out our shipbuilding over to Japan and Korea or over to, you know, I had Cato put this thing out today where they said, okay, well, if you're worried about Chinese missile envelopes to Japan and Korea, you can go to another country like Finland to build something. Well, Finland's pretty frigging close to, this, to, to Russia, I think. That's also another one of our peer-to-peer -peer competitors. But again, I, I don't think it's a wrong thing to do some of this. I really don't. I, I think we should make some deals and arrangements. However, I don't think we should stop shipbuilding in the United States. Matter of fact, one of the things I think we should do is do these partnerships. This Daewoo to Austell is a great idea of a partnership. I think having the Finns build a icebreaker for us and then taking that technology and bringing it back to the US to build more icebreakers, it'd be a great idea to do that, team up with them. That's great, let's do that. That's what needs to be done because shipbuilding is a lot different than it was in 1920 when the Jones Act was written. It's different than what we did in World War II and it's different than what we did in the 1980s and 1990s. It has evolved, we need to evolve. And But the biggest thing is the fact that shipyards will not say no to the US Navy because they can't, because it's their sole business. And if you're Huntington Ingalls, if you're Bath, if you're Electric Boat, if you're NASCO, if you're Austell USA, if you're Pascagoula, what are you going to do? You can't tell the Navy to go pound sand because your contract and what you want is un, you know, unimaginable. You know, Fincantieri can't do it. They need the frigate contract because of the phase out of the LCS. They need to do it. But what we need to do is take a moment, go back. Let's look at how Burke class destroyers are built in the U.S. Let's look at that cost sheet let's look at the cost sheet for japan for their you know maya class uh the otagos whichever ones are the latest burke classes let's look for the sojin the, the great the, the the korean version and let's see where the differences are remember a lot of that equipment that goes on those japanese korean ships are coming from the u.s too so we're providing a lot of that too and so there's a big question about that plus they're building those ships in commercial yards right alongside the burks in japan and the burks in korea are container ships or tankers or lng tankers so the shipyards have other business beyond just their navy and that is a key difference i hope you enjoyed today's episode if you did take a moment subscribe to the channel hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out leave a comment share it across social media and if you can support the page. How do you do that? Hit that super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a patron of the page, either monthly or yearly. Until our next episode, this is Sal, signing off.